science, and spiritual life. Evil starts when the mind concentrates only on science and is totally separated from God. This is why it is difficult for people who think this way to find inner peace and balance. By contrast, when the mind revolves around God and is illumined and sanctified, science is used both for our spiritual edification and for the benefit of the world. Do you mean to say, Yaranda, that science does not help people? Science can be of great help, but it also can muddle the mind greatly. I have met souls who possess great lucidity, even though their education was limited. If those who have muddled their mind with science manage to clarify it with the grace of God, then naturally they will have more tools for their work. But if these tools are not sanctified, if their knowledge lacks holiness, then it will be used only for secular work and not for spiritual work. Our tools can be sanctified very quickly if we have the right kind of concern. Scientists and educated people who give precedence to their inner formation, to the edification of the soul, and bring their secular education to the service of spiritual growth, they will experience a rapid spiritual transformation. If they also lead spiritual lives, they will be able to help many people positively by removing from their hearts the anxiety of hell and opening the way for heavenly joy. There are people of God who do not have as many academic degrees as others, but they can help people more because they're full of divine grace rather than diplomas. The world is so filled with sin that what we need the most is people given to prayer and to living a spiritual life. All these books and papers are paper money, valuable only if there are gold reserves in our bank, if our lives are spiritual through and through. And so we must drill into the mine of the soul, for otherwise science and education, it will be worth nothing. I remember an elderly monk at a Svegimenu monastery, Manathos, who was simple, so simple that he thought ascension was the name of a woman saint. He prayed to her on his Komboskini, Saint of God, Ascension, intercede for us. Once he had to feed a sick brother in the infirmary, he had nothing to offer him. He immediately went down the stairs, opened a window overlooking the sea, stretched out his arms and said, Ascension, my saint, give me a little fish for the brother. And right away, as if by miracle, a big fish jumped out of the sea and into his hands. The others who saw him were astonished. But he simply looked at them, smiling, as if he were saying, What's so strange about what you've just seen? And then look at us. We may know everything about the life and martyrdom of the saints, or about when and how the ascension took place, and yet we cannot even catch a tiny little fish. These are the strange and paradoxical things of the spiritual life, which the reasoning of those intellectuals that are centered on themselves and not on God cannot explain, because their knowledge is of, of this world and sterile. Their spirit is ill with secularism and their mind void of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not need engines to descend. The word of the mind does not transform the soul because it is of flesh. The word of God, born of the Holy Spirit, has divine energy and transforms the soul. The Holy Spirit does not need engines to descend. This is why theology has nothing to do with a sterile scientific spirit. The Holy Spirit descends on his own volition when he finds the right spiritual preconditions in man. And these conditions exist when we remove the rust from our spiritual cables and become good conductors for the spiritual current of divine illumination. It is then that we can become a spiritual scientist, a theologian. By theologian, I mean those theologians who have theological reserves, whose degree has value, not only those who carry a diploma as worthless as the paper money we had during the German occupation, Many times the mind labors for years to learn one or two foreign languages, and today most people will speak at least one foreign language. Yet these languages bear no relationship to the languages of the Holy Pentecost. 
and for this reason the society in which we live is the greatest babble ever. It is a great evil when we theolo theologize with our mind alone as if our mind is the Holy Spirit. The name for this is encephalology, and its offspring is babble. Whereas with true theology, there are many different languages, many charismata, but they are all in agreement because their leader is the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. And they are really tongues of fire. Yaranda the hymn says, All things are provided by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit provides, but only where there is room for him to enter. Otherwise, he will not be able to provide. The words of a humble soul with spiritual experiences, spoken with pain from the depths of his heart, have much greater value than the fancy philological talk of a man who speaks without the heart, firing the words one after the other from his trained tongue, but being incapable of touching other souls. For such words are spoken by a tongue of flesh and not a fiery tongue of Pentecost. Let us sanctify knowledge. Education and knowledge are good things, but if they are not sanctified, they are a waste and lead to disaster. Some university students arrived at my cell one day loaded with books. They said, Yeranda, we are here to discuss the Old Testament with you. God permits knowledge, doesn't he? What kind of knowledge do you mean? I asked them. Knowledge acquired with the mind? Yes, they answered. This kind of knowledge, I, I replied, will take you up to the moon, but will not lead you to God. It is good to have the intellectual powers that take man to the moon, costing billions of dollars in fuel expenses and so on. But it is better to have the spiritual powers that raise man to God, his ultimate destination, with only a bit of fuel, a mere dried piece of bread. Once I asked an American who visited me at the cell, what has this great nation of yours accomplished? We went to the moon, he replied. How far is that? I continued. Uh, let's say it's about half a million kilometers away, he responded. How many millions of dollars did you spend to get there? I asked next. Well, since 1950, he told me, we've spent rivers of dollars. Did you get to God? How far is he? I added. God, he said, is very, very far. Well, I replied, it only takes us a dry piece of bread to get to him. Natural knowledge helps us acquire spiritual knowledge. But when man remains at the level of natural knowledge, he is confined to nature and does not reach heaven. In other words, he remains on the earthly paradise, which was watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, enjoying beautiful nature with all its animals, but does not ascend to the heavenly paradise to rejoice with the angels and the saints. But in order to reach the heavenly paradise, we need to have faith in the landlord of paradise, to love him, realize how sinful we are, and be humbled. In this way, we will come to know him, to converse with him in prayer, and praise him for his help, but also for the ways in which he is testing us. Yaranda, does a person who finds peace in prostrations, fasting, asceticism, and so on, still need to study the dogmatic writings of the Church Fathers, theology? A basic education is actually a very helpful tool, but one should not seek knowledge in order to help or impress others with clever remarks. He should get an education in order to help himself. If we make the effort to sanctify whatever God may have given us, the light of grace will come and illumine our minds. It's in that light that we need we will find all the dogmatics and theology that we need. There will be experience. There we will experience the mysteries of God. But we should also realize that other people may have a simple disposition and do not wish to learn more, being content with anything that God may give them. What should we make of the fact that though we live in a monastery, we still desire the knowledge of the world? What this means is that we lack true knowledge. And you shall know the truth, and the truth 
shall make you free. When man is humbled and illumined, then his mind and its reasoning powers are rendered holy, whereas before they worked only in a carnal way. Their energy was of the flesh. An unlettered man who out of egoism overlooks his ignorance and tries to interpret the doctrines of the faith, to read the apocalypse, the writings of the Holy Fathers, will certainly become confused and will end up losing his faith. God's grace will abandon him because he acted out of egoism. You see, humility helps in everything we do. It provides the strength we need. The wisest thing I may think of, the wisest solution to a problem I may discover, will be sheer nonsense if it contains egoism, whereas humility will always bring wisdom. This is why we must struggle with philotimo and much humility. Otherwise, instead of doing us good, our efforts will bring the opposite result. When our mind becomes muddled and we end up saying blasphemous things, it's because we acted with egoism. This is something we cannot control. Even an educated man runs the risk of being harmed when attempting to interpret the dogmas of the church let alone an uneducated person who tries to penetrate into the patristic spirit without having reached a spiritual state. For if he had reached even a low level in the spiritual state, he would not have tried in the first place. He would have thought, mm, if I need something, God will send his light. In the meantime, let, let me practice the many things I already understand. That should keep me busy. In other words, Yet the lack of humility and piety lead people to misinterpret the gospel. That's right, because when humility is missing, the interpretations we are likely to give are the product of logical reasoning alone. They lack divine illumination. When we do not understand something, should we leave it for later? Yes, we must say, it says something good here, but I do not understand it. This is exactly what I did. When I was reading the gospel as a young man and did not understand something, I did not try to interpret it. I would say to myself, it says something good here, but I do not understand it. Later, I would realize that when an interpretation was needed, it would come to me instantly. But then again, I would say, let me ask someone else how this should be interpreted. It would turn out to be exactly the way I had understood it. It is great impudence for someone to try to interpret the gospel, especially if he does not understand it. This is why when you study the gospel, you should not attempt to interpret it with your mind. Instead, cultivate good thoughts until divine illumination brings you discernment. Things will then become clear on their own with no effort from you. Can we understand something at a deeper level when we have a better spiritual state? Not at a deeper level. One divine truth has many divine meanings. Some may be understood now and some later. A person may study for years and learn a lot, and yet he may not be able to grasp the meaning of the Holy Gospel. By contrast, someone else who does not study much, but has humility and an ascetic spirit, can come to a true understanding because his mind is illumined by God. Moreover, if we wish to study more, our motive may be vainglory or pleasure, not unlike that of a person who watches wrestling and is constantly checking his watch because he wants to catch as many games as possible. You see, he is enjoying wrestling, but does not wish to learn anything about it. Not only will he never become a wrestler, but he will remain nothing more than a spectator. Yet on the people often call the educated person a cultivated person. Is this always true? When we say that someone is a cultivated person, we mean that he is a person who is cultivated spiritually, a spiritually mature person. I've noticed that among uneducated people, there are some who are very proud and others who are very humble. It's the same among the educated. Some are very proud and others are very humble. In other words, what makes the difference is how cultivated one is in spiritual terms. This is why St. Basil the Great says, quote, The most important thing is to hold a high position and have a humble disposition. End quote. A person who has reached an important position in life may be justified to feel a bit proud about it, but someone who has not has no excuse. 
What really matters is that we are cultivated within. If in addition to that, one is also educated and has a humble disposition, then this is the best of all worlds. But to not be highly educated and yet to think highly of ourselves, well, that's inexcusable. Knowledge puffs up. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. When only the outer man is educated, education proves to be harmful because it gives rise to an inflated idea of self. This idea then becomes a barrier that prevents the grace of God from coming close to us. But when we put our, away our false view of self-importance, then God, who is a benef- benevolent and generous Father, will enrich us with his divine and luminous ideas. Those, by contrast, who are not willing to give up their sense of self-importance certainly have a brain and a body, but they lack the grace of God, the Holy Spirit. In other words, there is a danger that too much knowledge may inflate the head and turn it into an air balloon that may either explode in midair from schizophrenia or break up into pieces from pride. This is the reason why knowledge should proceed with fear of God and in alignment with action and praxis. It should be balanced. When these elements are missing, knowledge will only cause harm. When egoism takes charge and I start talking so that others will admire my reasoning skills, then spiritual laws go into effect that help me come to my senses. But when this happens constantly, the outcome is not good. If a small piece of hair falls into the eye, it will cause a minor irritation. But if it happens all the time, the irritation will be serious. This is what happens with spiritual irritation. When we are smart and do our work with ease, we must fall apart before God, thanking him day and night that he has given us this ability, and we can work without getting tired. How could we not do that? Yet under what if a person believes that he is not able or capable of achieving anything? Then that person is being tempted by the devil from the opposite side. The camel was once asked, Do you like going uphill better than going downhill? And the camel answered back, Why, can't I go on the straight and level path? Those who happen to have a weak mind fare better. God has given us brains so that we may have a better life, but look what we have done with this gift. One day we will have to answer to him. God's providence is active everywhere. Those who are not very bright can be happy here and happier in the next life, while those who are very bright have nothing but problems. Yet under will the mentally impaired be well in the next life? Will they have a normal mind? No matter how much mind one carries, lots of it or just a small amount, in the end it will be turned into pulp. When it reaches heaven, the mind will become noose. In heaven, the the theologian saints and the mentally impaired will not differ in their knowledge of God. God may even be more generous to the latter because they were deprived of so many things in this life. We must put our mind to good use. Why then, Yananda, do you often say that education is an advantage in the monastic life? Look, An educated person may take a work of the fathers and with only a little effort make great progress because for him the text is easy to understand. An uneducated person, by contrast, especially if he is not pious, will have a hard time with it. He needs to have lived a spiritual life and have some experience of divine things so that through them he can understand what he's reading. Now take the educated person. All he needs to advance is a little effort, provided that his mind does its job and does not get absorbed in theory. I am not, however, suggesting that he should try to know the mysteries of God by his mind. In other words, Yeronda, we should use our mind against the passions. Not only that, but more generally, we should take notice of God's beneficence and of the universe all around us and give him thanks and praise. You see, it was Abraham that first sought God, not the other way around. What do you mean? 
Abraham's father was a pagan. He worshipped idols. But Abraham, he saw the universe, was puzzled that his people were worshipping inanimate idols. So he put his mind to work. It's not possible, he thought, that these soulless things, these pieces of wood are divine and creators of this universe who made the sky, the stars, and the sun. I must find the true God, and once I do, I will believe and worship only him. Then God came and revealed himself to Abraham and said, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Genesis 12.1 And he led them He led him to Hebron and made him a favorite son. You see, an educated person will advance even without piety. All he needs is a little humility to engage in spiritual work. Take, for for instance, the time that I served in radio communications in the army. When I got there, I realized that some codes were written in English. Those who were educated and knew some English could understand them right away but the rest of us had difficulty. The same was true of the theoretical subjects we were being taught. The educated among us understood them readily because they had the foundation, but the rest of us, again, had a hard time following. We must get to know the beneficence of God. We must understand what has been given to us. Why did God give us a mind? So that we may examine, study, and observe ourselves and everything around us. God did not give us a mind so that we may constantly spend our time figuring out how to find the fastest means of transportation from one country to another. He gave us a mind because he wants us to preoccupy ourselves with the most important thing, how to reach our true destination, how to get close to God, to what is our one true country, paradise. How much good has God done for those of ancient Israel? What signs? What events? But when Moses was late in coming down from Mount Sinai with the tablets and the Ten Commandments, the people gave their golden jewelry to make a golden image of a calf and went on to worship it. Exodus 32, 1-6 It's difficult to find people with a calf's mind in our days. This is why an educated man who cannot tell right from wrong cannot be justified. God gave us a mind so we can search for our creator. The Europeans have bewildered the human mind. They are confused and going downhill because they've taken God out of their lives. Then there are those who, while they have all the advantages to get ahead, a good and sharp mind and so on, fail to pay attention to what you tell them. The moment you try to give them a hint They interrupt you, yeah, yeah, I understand, they say, and then rush to complete your sentence. Among the young men who come to the holy mountain, there are some who are very intelligent. They seem to understand everything you tell them, but in reality they get nothing because they are not paying attention. Those who are not as bright actually fare better since they pay attention. They wait prudently to hear what you have to say next. And this way they retain what they hear. Then there are those who understand a lot, collect pieces of advice from here and from there, but in the end do nothing at all with it. They scatter and waste the mind that God's given them. They are full of pride, and they don't allow the grace of God to come over them. By contrast, others who are not as bright come and humble themselves. I am not very smart, they tell me. Do you remind mind repeating please what you said. And once they understand, they try to put the advice you give them to practice. This is why they are filled with grace and they make progress in their spiritual life. A humble person is usually well learned, but an egoist finds it so hard to humble himself by asking a question that he never learns anything. St. Arsenios the Great was the most educated man in the Byzantine Empire. The emperor Theodosius the Great had him as a tutor to his children, Arcadius and Honorius. But when he went to the desert to become a monk, he sat at the feet of Abba Makarios, who was illiterate. And Arsenius used to say of him, I do not know even the alphabet of this man. 
Yet under how can we avoid examining everything only with our mind? Man has to make good use of his mind. He must put it to work for the grandeur of God, to seek God. He must not make his mind a God. Those who are bright should be advanced spiritually. One quick look and they understand. When we make good use of our mind, we can be of great help to others. Otherwise, we can cause them great pain. I have in mind some cases among lay people. I once knew a little boy who had three little brothers. They lost their father and their mother got married again. The little orphans never had any love either from their mother or their stepfather. So this little boy grew up and he opened a store and he started making a living. One day he heard that someone died and left behind three orphans. He felt compassion for the children and said to the widow, Will you marry me and live with me like a sister to protect these children? She accepted. Now they are living together a very spiritual life, reading the lives of the saints, the Philokalia, and visiting holy monasteries. They also have a spiritual father who guides them. This young man had the right thought and did the right thing, and thus he received divine grace. Otherwise the devil would have told him, Hey, this is your chance to make these orphans suffer as you suffered when you were a child. He did not look to take revenge with malice, but, quote, retaliated with kindness. Some people will use their mind for good and invent good things. Others, prompted by the devil, put them to work in order to destroy and harm. We can see this in the case of Cain and Abel. Did God create Abel one way and Cain another? No. But Abel took the mind that God had given him and used it in the right way. He thought, God has given me an entire flock. How can I deny him a little lamb? So he goes and kills the best lamb he had and offered as a sacrifice to God. Now, Cain took wheat filled with straw and offered it to God. One of them offered to God the best lamb, while the other offered useless straw. Fine. Let's say that you do not want to offer a lamb. Offer at least some clean and pure wheat. Well, that's not what he does, unfortunately. He takes wheat and straw and puts it on the fire. Compare the two offerings. God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. So Cain became jealous. He killed his brother. And then... God took Abel with him to paradise while Cain was left wandering in the woods like a wild beast. Of course, God gave both of them the same freedom, but only Abel used it in the right way. With Pain and Love for Contemporary Man Continued, Volume 1 of St. Paisios, the Hagiorite Spiritual Councils, published by Holy Monastery Evangelist John the Theologian Surati, Thessalonica, Greece. Part 3 continued, The Spirit of God and the Spirit of the World. Chapter 2, Rationalism in Our Times. Logic and Spiritual Life. Yet under what is the place of reason and logic in the spiritual life? Which logic are you talking about? If you mean secular logic, then this kind of logic has no place at all in the spiritual life. Footnote. When the elder refers to logic and reproaches it, he does not mean by this term the gift of reason with which God has honored human beings, but rather rationalism, or as he calls it, quote, afflicted reason, the logic that is void of faith in God, rejects divine providence, and denies the possibility of miracles. To continue, angels and saints enter through our windows, we can see them, talk with them, and then they leave. There's no way that one can explain this logically. Today, increased knowledge and trust in logic has, unfortunately, shaken our faith to its foundations and filled our souls with question marks and doubts. This is why we don't have miracles anymore, because a miracle cannot be explained logically. It can only be experienced but faith in God will bring down divine power and overturn all human expectations. It will perform miracles, resurrect the dead, 
and astonish science. From the outside, all things pertaining to the spiritual life seem upside down. Indeed, the mysteries of God will be impossible to know and will appear strange and contrary to nature as long as we don't overturn our secular mindset and see everything with spiritual eyes. Those who believe that they can come to know God's mysteries through mere scientific theory without a spiritual life resemble a fool who thinks he can look through a telescope and see paradise. Logic is very harmful when we use it to scrutinize the divine, the mysteries, and the miracles. Logic drove the Roman Catholics, as I have heard, to put the Holy Communion through chemical tests to determine if it is the actual body and blood of Christ. Now think of the saints who had so much faith that they could often see flesh and blood on the Holy Communion spoon. Pretty soon they'll be putting the saints through an x-ray machine to establish their sainthood. Thus the Catholics got rid of the Holy Spirit, put logic in its place, and now spend their time with, quote, white magic. I said to a Catholic, a man with a good disposition, who came to see me and was in tears, among the most important differences that we have with you is that you put the mind first, whereas we put faith. You have developed rationalism, and in general you stress the human factor. This way you limit the power of God, because you put divine grace aside. You put a preservative in holy water to keep it from spoiling. We, on the other hand, pour holy water on spoiled things, and they become fresh again. We believe in grace that sanctifies, and for this reason, holy water remains unspoiled for 200 years, 500 years. It never spoils. In other words, yet under what has happened is that logic and rationalism have taken the precedence over God. Could it be that what we are talking about is not logic but pride? Because you see, this kind of logic is actually impaired rather than sound reason. Pride is reason that is impaired full of egoism, harboring demons. When this sort of logic is involved in all our actions, we grant rights to the devil to intervene. Yet under, when a spiritual person is confronting temptation, can, can't they make use of logic? St. Paisio says, In that case, they should do what is humanly possible, and where something is not in their power, they should leave it to God. There are some people who will try to grasp everything only with their mind. For example, those who say the Jesus prayer silently, only with their mind. They put pressure on their mind to concentrate and they end up getting a headache. If I were to deal this way with the problems I face, that I have to face daily, do you think that I would be able to manage? I just do what is humanly possible and leave the rest to God. I say to myself, God will show me. He will enlighten me, and I will know what to do. You will hear many people complain, How will I get this done, and how will I manage to finish this or that? The smallest problem gives them a headache. If we try to solve problems using nothing else but our logic, we will end up quite confused. In each and every one of our actions, God must take the lead. Everything we do, we must do trusting God, for otherwise we will be full of anxiety our mind will get overwhelmed, and our soul will be miserable. Yaranda, you have said that you never reach the point of mental exhaustion. How is that possible? Yes, this is true, and it happens because I do not handle problems with my mind. If I get a headache, I get it because of a cold or low blood pressure. I have to deal with so many things. Every day, people come to me with their problems and their pain. I also think of those who come before with their various problems, the sick and so on. And if someone should get well, they don't let me know so that I could rejoice a little. I go on worrying about them too. Yarandu, what's the proper way for a monk or a nun to deal with their thoughts so that they will not be exhausted by logic? They should put their thoughts in order using spiritual rather than secular logic. They should turn the dial to the spiritual frequency 
and think and approach everything spiritually. Even a lay person who leads a spiritual life should have no use for secular logic. This way of thinking is right only for good persons who have no faith. Yet under what do you mean by approaching everything spiritually? A spiritual approach is when you enjoy the opposite of what secular people enjoy. For example, when you are pleased by the fact that people are not paying any attention to you. If we want to enter the spiritual realm, we must move in the opposite direction from the one people in the world would expect us to move. Is it money you want? You should give it all away, including your wallet. Is it a throne you're looking for? Be prepared to sit humbly on a stool. How about us, Yaranda? What's our percentile when it comes to logic? You must be released from the bonds of logic. I pray that this will happen out of love, the divine madness of love. You see, Christians who trust everything to rationalism, that is, to proud logic, are no better off than the, the patients of Limbedi, a well-known psychiatric hospital. In Thessaloniki. We suffer from secular logic. Yeranda, when I feel my heart become hard like a stone, what should I do? Your problem is not a hard heart, but a mind-driven heart. Your entire heart has been taken over by your mind and is now at its service. But there is still a chance for your heart to go back. How? Each day you must read a canon from the Theotokion, collection of footnote, a collection of 62 hymnological canons consisting of a series of odes to the Theotokos. In 1796, St. Dakotimus the Hagiorite published the Theotokion after he diligently collected these canons from Holy Mountain manuscripts. To continue, each day you must read a canon from the Theotokion Tokarion, if you want your heart to get back in shape, that's the best medicine. You do have a heart, but it has been clouded by logic. You're following the European rubrics, the European way of thinking. You want to be true to form and do everything right. If you were a European clerk, you would be exemplary, always on time, impeccable in your duties, an example to follow. If you were to apply this, this integrity to spiritual matters, you would certainly make great spiritual strides and reach paradise soon. But you see, the European spirit with its logic is not heading to God, but to the moon. Now you're behaving like a civil servant. Things are different in spiritual life. What is needed is simplicity. Act with simplicity and trust in God. How can I become simple, Yeranam? I shall have to open your head and put an old-fashioned mind in it. You need to enter the simple world of the Yerondikon and get to know the spiritual science which lifts and refreshes the soul and gets rid of headaches. Logic will make us suffer. For example, I say to myself, this must be done in this specific manner, and so I go ahead and do it because it has to be done. I don't do it with my heart, but because logic dictates it. Logic and Courtesy may tell me that I must surrender my seat, but my heart will not. Think of the difference when my heart is moved and I surrender my seat out of love. I feel such joy. We should keep the self out of our actions. We should not act for the sake of our own comfort. This will keep Christ away from us. We should act for the comfort of others, and this way we too shall be comforted. God will then find comfort in us, and we will cease to be merely human. We shall become deified. But if we put only the mind in charge, everything will be carnal and human. Secular logic tires the mind, weakens the body. It constricts the heart, while spiritual logic expands it. When used correctly, the mind can spur the heart and help it. When the mind or the noose enters the heart, and the two work together, our work is not anymore the work of logic and reason. Sound reasoning is a gift, but this gift must be restored and sanctified. Yaranda, 
I don't have a heart. You do have a heart, but as soon as it tries to act, your mind puts a muzzle on it. You must try to acquire the logic of the heart, faith, and love. How can I achieve this? The first step, go downtown to Thessaloniki, march barefoot in protest so that people will say that you went mad. This way you will get rid of your mind. Blessed soul, you approach everything with mathematical exactness. What are you, an astronomer? If you stop thinking logically, you'll be able to start working spiritually on yourself. What should I study, Ananda, to help me get rid of this secular logic? First, you must read the Yerondikon. Philotheus' history, <clears throat> footnote the collection of instructive incidences and sayings of the monks and laity during the time of the early church, and the Evangetinos, the well-known anthology of ascetical and patristic sayings and incidents, which was compiled by the monk Paul, the Evangetinos, the founder of the famous monastery of the Theotokos Evangetithos in Constantinople. To continue, all these books are practical, not theoretical. Their simple, patristic spirit and holiness will help you remove secular logic from your mind. Next, you should read Abba Isaac, and this way you will see, not see him as a philosopher, but as a man illumined by God. Secular logic will adulterate our spiritual sense. The Holy Father saw everything with the spiritual, the divine eye. Patristic texts were written in the Spirit of God, and it was in the Spirit of God that the Holy Fathers gave their interpretations. Today this spirit is lacking, and patristic texts are hard to understand. People see everything with secular eyes and cannot see beyond that. They do not have the breath of the Spirit and res that results from faith and love. Arsenios the Great used to leave palm leaves in the water without changing it, and the water would have a strong stench. It is beyond us today to understand what sprang from that unclean water. Footnote. Ab Arsenios only changed the water for his palm leaves once a year. The rest of the time he simply added to it. Some monks implored him in these words, why do you not change the water for these palm leaves when it smells so bad? He said to them, Instead of the aromatic perfumes I once enjoyed in the world, I must now endure this unpleasant smell. From the sayings of the Desert Fathers, Ab Arsenios, page 9.18, to continue. But I don't understand that, we hear some people say. They do not take the time to see if there is something there, perhaps something they overlooked. They simply reject it because they do not understand it. When logic gets involved, we'll have a hard time understanding the gospel and the Holy Fathers. Our spiritual sense is so altered that our logic will prove the gospel and the works of the Holy Fathers useless. And we will say things like, All these years of asceticism and fasting have not done us any good. Well, this is blasphemy. Once a young monk who lived in Achille came to my cell driving a car. My son, I said, why do you need this car? It doesn't fit a monk. Why, Yeranda, he answered, doesn't the gospel say we'll receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life? I replied, when the gospel says we'll receive a hundredfold, it refers to the things that a person needs. But the state that best fits the monk is what the Apostle Paul means when he describes Christians as having nothing and yet possessing everything, 2 Corinthians 6.10. In other words, the monk has no possessions, but he has virtue, and this is why people will trust him with their wealth. This does not mean that we monks should have possessions. Do you see how logic can lead one to the wrong interpretation? You must always remember that if we are not purified. If divine illumination does not come to us, our interpretations will be muddled and obscure. They asked me once, quote, Why didn't the Panagia perform a miracle on the island of Tinos to prevent the Italians from blowing up the Greek forget Ellis on the day of her feast? 
Actually, the Panagia performed a greater miracle on that day. The attack on, on Ellis, 15th of August, 1940, made the Greeks indignant. And once they realized that the Italians would not respect anything, they went after them and kicked them out, shouting, Era! Two footnotes. On the Italians, on 28th October 1940, Italy fighting on the side of Nazi Germany invaded Greece. And Era, a battle cry of the Greek soldiers during World War II. It means literally air metaphorically get blown away to continue had the attack in dinos not taken place the greeks might have thought ha the italians are religious people like us and they're our friends they would not have realized the measure of their impiety and now these people come with their logic and ask why didn't the penegia perform a miracle what can i say then some will ask me how do they know that the fire in Babylon was actually 49 cubits high when they threw in the three young men? Did they have it measured? Since the fire was seven cubits high at first, and then they added more fuel to increase it to sevenfold, doesn't seven times seven make 49? Don't you feel like throwing such people into the fire? You see all this rationalism, this secular logic that is completely out of touch with reality. Some modern theologians will spend their time on such things. For example, they may ask, did the demons that fell into the sea survive or drown? Matthew 8.32 Well, if, if the important thing is that they left the man, why are you so concerned with what happened to them? Make sure that you don't get possessed yourself. And don't bother with where the demons are now. Yet under, some people are trying to reconcile the gospel with human logic. They examine the gospel with secular logic and cannot make any sense out of it. St. Paisos. The gospel and secular logic cannot be reconciled. In the gospel there is love, while in secular logic there is self-interest. The gospel says... And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Matthew 5, 41. Where is the logic here? This is straight madness. That is why those who try to reconcile the gospel with secular logic find themselves in utter confusion. There are, for example, various charitable groups engaging in charitable work. They learn, for instance, that someone has suffered a great loss, let's say a bankruptcy, needs money. Let's help him, they say, but only after we verify that indeed he is in need. So two or three of them will decide to visit his house to see if he's really in need. And let's say that they see, for example, that he has a luxurious dining set, and they conclude, oh, these armchairs and dining set are so nice. If he has such expensive furniture, he cannot be in need. And they end up giving him nothing. What they don't understand is that this person may be hungry. When someone becomes poor, they don't change their clothes from one minute to another. There is no way of knowing that this dining set was not something he had had from before and hasn't yet been able to sell it. Or maybe someone who heard about the plight of the family gave it to them. They judge everything with logic and get confused and they keep the gospel out of their lives. People look at others from the outside rather than from the heart. And for this reason, they see them in the wrong light. Judging by appearances. John 7, verse 24. Yet and I feel that my judgment, my logic, and my sense of human justice are an obstacle to my spiritual progress. Of course they are obstacles to your spiritual progress, because where they are present, God's grace is absent. And then we're left without divine assistance and we fall flat on our face. As a rule, human judgment and justice, and justice are unjust. God's justice is full of love, forbearance, and forgiveness. The virus causing your spiritual disease is your tendency to examine things with human logic. The medicine that will cure you is good thoughts. When our thinking is on the right side and our thoughts are good, 
the capacity of our heart increases. You tend to use logic too much, and for this reason you must be very careful with your thoughts because the conclusions you reach based on logic are human and not spiritual, not holy. Yet under why do I criticize others so much? In your case, it's your law studies that should be blamed. Studies in a particular field or work in a particular profession will often cultivate in us a dry logic. Logic is the disease of intellectuals. It is inside their bone marrow. Even though you have a heart, you will still put logic ahead. There are some people who have great capacity for logic and egotistical judgment. They will dismiss the views of everybody else. They expect absolute correctness from others, but not from themselves. They are comfortable with their own weaknesses and eager to blame others. This is all very strange. These people are well-formed externally, but they have created a human being full of hypocrisy, without a trace of simplicity. This is the difference between Europeans and Greeks, and by Greeks I mean the orthodox spirit. You can never figure out the right way to approach a European. He'll always welcome you with a fake smile. But with a Greek, it's different. You always know how he feels. Is he happy? He'll show it. Is he upset? He will show it. And this way you will know how to deal with him. Yet under what's wrong when one passes judgment on people, things, and situations, and actually does that very quickly? This happens when one's actions are based only on logic. Only the mind works, and it shows. It would be helpful if God were to take a screwdriver and turn it a little on these people. The more we empty our mind, the more we are filled with grace. The less logic, the more grace. When I say mind, I mean human judgment, egoism, and self-confidence. From the moment we acknowledge that we may not have the right judgment and say, I risk making mistakes because my judgment is secular and lacks divine illumination. I should stop using it. God will enlighten us and make us more discriminating and capable of discerning right from wrong. The tempter makes intelligent people useless because it leads them to judge things by their appearances. When man has only the human element in his nature, he will judge in human terms and even commit crimes. Once the human element is removed, his judgment can become divine. A secular judgment is a wrong judgment. We witness so many injustices. People are tempted and scandalized all the time. That is why you must always invite the good thoughts to en ensure a good state for your soul. Man is such a mystery. It's so difficult to know his inner self, to know what he is thinking. Once, on the day of Pascha, after the Divine Liturgy, we stopped for a while at a cell to eat cheese and eggs. I noticed that the monk sitting next to me, whose job was to transport wood, was not eating what was offered to him, but was putting it aside. Eat, I said to him. All right, I will, he replied. But I saw that he was not eating anything. Eat, I said once again. Today is Pascha. Bless me, Father, he replied. But when I receive Holy Communion, I do not eat. At two o'clock, I will eat. He had not eaten since the day before, and he would not eat again until the afternoon. Do you see what he did out of piety and devotion? And the others may have thought he was only a simple transporter of wood. Man is a mystery. Now when you are asked to pass judgment on something or someone, you must stop and think, is this judgment a divine judgment or is it filled with passion? That is to say, is our judgment disinterested or is it self-serving? You should not trust yourselves on or your judgment. When we judge others, we are full of egoism. I'm often asked to judge a situation and I end up doing it against my will. Well, even though in the end, I judge selflessly and impartially when I go to pray. The sweetness that I usually feel when I pray, it's not there. This is not because my conscience bothers me over something. 
but simply because I judged as a man. Now imagine how I would feel if the judgment were wrong and justified on human grounds alone. Judgment is a very serious matter. It belongs to God. It is dreadful. The good intentions of the person passing the judgment do not really matter. What matters is the outcome. We need to have discernment at all times. Naturally, all of us have some, but unfortunately most of us will not use it on ourselves but on others so that they will not appear better than we are. Thus we pollute our discernment with judgments, criticisms, and demands that others must correct themselves when we should only demand improvement of ourself. For we are the ones who are not taking the spiritual struggle seriously. We are not putting an end to the rule of our passions so that our soul may be set free and fly toward heaven. Part 3, Continued the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the World. Chapter 3, The New Generation. The Spirit of Sacrifice is Missing. Most people today have not tasted the joy of sacrifice and are not fond of toil. An easygoing, lazy life and much comfort have taken center stage. Gone are philotimo and sacrifice. People consider it a great achievement when they succeed in something without making an effort, when they are easily accommodated. But when they have to make an effort, they're unhappy. If they were approaching life spiritually, things would be different. The mere opportunity to struggle would give them joy. Nowadays, both young and old care only for convenience and comfort. Spiritual people aspire to holiness, but they want to get there the easy way. Those who live in the world want to make more money, but work less. Young people want to pass their exams without studying and get their diplomas without ever leaving the coffee shops. And if possible, they would even love to call from there and get their exam scores over the phone. This is how far they will go. Many young students come to my cell and tell me, pray for me to pass my exams. They do not study and then say, God will help me. You must study and pray too, I advise them. Why, they answer, can't God help me? They expect God to bless their laziness. That's not possible. Now, if someone studies hard because he doesn't get anything out of it, God will help him. There are some young people who have memory and comprehension problems, but try hard themselves nevertheless. God will help them become brilliant. Fortunately, there are exceptions. A young man from Halkidiki applied to three university schools and was accepted in all of them with a first or second rank. Footnote, in the past in Greece, it was customary for students to take entrance exams for more than one university school. To continue, but he felt more comfortable finding a job to relieve his father who was working in the mines. So he deferred his studies and took a job. Such souls are medicine for me. I am willing to die for them, to have them step all over me. Most young people, however, have been affected by the secular spirit, and they're in bad shape. All they know is how to take care of their needs. They could not care less about others. They only think of themselves. The more you help them, the lazier they become. You cannot imagine how bland some young people are today. All they do is judge everything and get bored with everything, when in essence the heart is never bored and does not get old. The monastic life, they find it boring. Marriage scares them. You see, these robust young men, they come to the holy mountain again and again and again and say, Oh, the monk's life is so tough, you must get up at midnight every day, not just one or two days a week. So they return to the world. What will I do in this kind of society, they wonder? What kind of person will I have to live with if I get married? Oh, it's such a bother, they conclude. And then they return again to the holy mountain. They stay for a while, then they start all over again. It's so tough here. 
Young people of today resemble new engines whose oil is frozen. The oil has to be warmed in order for the engines to restart. There is no other way. Many young men, troubled souls, come to myself. It's not just one or two. They ask me, what should I do, Father? How should I spend my time? I am bored. Find a job, my son. I have money. I don't need to work, he tells me. But I reply, the Apostle Paul says, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 You must work in order to eat even if you have money. Work helps a man thaw out the oil of his engine. To work is to create. It gives you joy and it takes away your stress and boredom. So my son, this is what you should do. Find a job that you like enough to get started. Just give it a try and you will see the difference. But then there are also young men who will get tired, but they find rest in fatigue because they find fulfillment. Some will come to my cell, sit around, get tired, do nothing. Others who have a lot of philotimo will ask me constantly, is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything we can get you? I never ask for anything. At night, I use the flashlight to do my errands, whether it is fe fetching wood, to light the stove or straightening the place up. Many of the visitors, they create a mess, leaving mud and wet socks everywhere. I give them the fine socks that I receive as gifts and they throw away their soiled ones. I give them paper napkins to wrap them and dispose of them, but they leave them lying around. Three times in my life I have asked for something. Once I told a young man, I need two boxes of matches from Keriez, even though I had four lighters. I did this only to make him happy. He rushed there and returned out of breath to bring the matches, but this fatigue refreshed him because he tasted the joy of sacrifice. And all along, another fellow was getting tired just from sitting around. These young men are looking for joy, but joy will not come if we don't sacrifice ourselves. Sacrifice gives birth to joy. Real joy comes from philotimo. Once we cultivate philotimo, sacrificial love, then we'll have a real festival inside us. Egoism and self-love is what causes us pain. That's where we get stuck. Two young officers had come to the holy mountain and told me that they wanted to become monks. Hey, why do you want to become monks? How long have you been thinking about it? I asked. Just now, they said, we visited the holy mountain and thought of staying here in case a war breaks out. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? I asked. Listen to them. If a war breaks out, and how will you manage to, to leave the army? We will find an excuse. What excuse were they going to find? They would probably pretend they're crazy or they will come up with something else. If you set out to become a monk with this mindset, you failed already, I told them. There are also those who, even though they have been planning for a long time to get married and start a family, they'll come to me and they'll tell me, why should I marry? These are difficult times to raise a family. Fine, I replied. Did life stop during the time of persecutions? Weren't people working or getting married then? Or are you perhaps too lazy to get married? I want to become a monk, he insists. But you're bored. What kind of hard-working monk are you going to be? Do you see my point? If a woman wants to become a nun because she's thinking, eh, what's the point of staying in the world of getting married, having kids, headaches, and troubles... I'll go to a holy monastery where I'll do what they tell me and I'll have no responsibilities and if they should reprimand me, I'll just bow my head. Why bother having my own household? At the monastery, lodging and food will be provided. This kind of person will definitely fail right from the start. Do you find this strange? There are a lot of people who think like this. You must know that a hard-working man will prosper no matter what he does. A hard-working family man would also be a good monk, and a hard-working monk would also be a good family man. 
There was once someone who had joined a monastery as a novice and did not want to become a monk. Why, my son, are you still a novice? I asked him. Because the monk's cap reminds me of a helmet, was his answer. Can you believe this? This person did not want to become a monk because he did not want to wear the monk's cap. It reminded him of a helmet. When did he ever wear a helmet? Maybe he did a few times while he was training in the army. Imagine if he had been to war. Listen to that. It reminded him of a helmet. What a thing to say. Why would such a person ever want to be a monk? When someone starts this way, what kind of monk will he be, can you tell me? The poor fellow. He finally became a monk in some monastery, but never put on a thick monastic cap. Another time, two young men came to my cell and their hair was really long. I tried to give them a haircut, but they resisted, and since I was in a hurry, I, I only offered them a treat. At that time, I had a kitten. One of them tells me, May I take it? Take it, I said. They left in the rain, one of them holding the cat in his lap, and they headed for Iveron Monastery an hour's walk away. He asked if he could spend the night at the Arkandariki with the cat. That's not possible, he was told, and he ended up staying outside in the rain all night. If you had asked him to stay guard for one hour, he would have said, no, I can't. But he was perfectly able to stay out a whole night holding a kitten in his arms. Another young man had gone to serve in the army, but one day he took off. Later he came to myself, I want to become a monk, he said. Well, you should go finish your military service first, was my answer. But the army is not like my home, he replied. Well, thank you for letting me know, I said. This way I can warn others about it. Meanwhile, his family had been looking for him. A few days later, he reappeared early one morning. It was the Sunday after P Pascha, the Sunday of St. Thomas. I need you, he tells me. What do you want, I ask him. Where did you go to church? Nowhere, he said. Today, on Sunday of St. Thomas, the monasteries keep vigils, and you did not go to church? And you want to become a monk? Where were you? I stayed at a hotel where it's quiet. I find the monasteries too noisy, he replied. And what are you going to do now, I asked him. I'm thinking of going to the monastery at Sinai because I want to live a hard life, he replied. I said, hey, wait a minute. I went inside and got him some, some fresh Easter bread, gave it to him and said, here, take this soft Pascha bread to help you start your hard life and get out of here. This is today's youth. They do not know what they want. They will not take any pressure. How can they possibly sacrifice themselves? I remember in the army there were all kinds of urgent needs, and every time this happened, men would say, Commander, let me go to this mission. This man is married, has children, and it will be a pity for these children to be left without a father. There they were, asking the commander to send them to the front lines. They found joy in the idea of getting killed so that others with children would not have to die and leave their children alone. I can't imagine anyone making this kind of sacrifice today. It would be a rare thing. Once we'd run out of water, the commander located on the map an area where he could find water, but the gorillas were there. He told us, there's water somewhere near, but it is very dangerous. Who will go to fill some canteens with water? I will have to be done in the, it'll have to be done in the dark. One man came forward immediately. I will go, Commander, and then another, and then another. Everybody wanted to go. It was going to be a night mission in the dark and a dangerous one. You cannot all go, the Commander said. What I am trying to say is that no one thought of himself in that situation. You did not hear, Ah, Commander, my foot is hurting, or, Oh, Commander, I've got a headache, or I'm too tired. Everybody wanted to go even though our life was at risk. These days... There's a lukewarm spirit. There's no manliness, no sacrifice. 
people's afflicted logic has turned everything upside down. You see, in the past, people would go voluntarily to serve in the army, whereas today they will try to get a doctor to diagnose them as crazy to get an exemption. They will try everything to avoid the draft. This was unheard of in the old days. In our unit, we had a 23-year-old lieutenant, young but very brave. One day, his father, a retired army officer, called him to say that he was planning to use his influence to have him relocated from the front lines to the rear. The lieutenant became really upset. Shame on you, father, for saying such things. Only drones do nothing. His honesty, candor, and bravery exceeded all bounds. He was always first in the front line. His great coat was full of bullet holes, but he was still alive. When he was discharged, he took the great coat with him as a souvenir. Indiscriminate love spoils children. I've observed that today many children, especially those who are students, are harmed by their families. While they're basically good kids, good children, they're rendered useless. They don't put their mind to work. They've become insensitive. It is the parents who spoil them. Because the parents have gone through difficult years, they do not want their children to be deprived of anything. They don't cultivate philotomo in their children so that they can find joy in deprivation. It's not that parents don't mean well. It would be cruel to deprive a child that does not understand the reason for the deprivation. But it is right for the parents to try and help their children acquire a sort of monastic conscience, to rejoice when they do not have something that they want. Now, with their goodness, their indiscriminate goodness and generosity, parents are spoiling their children. They use no discernment and end up stupefying them. These children expect to be served at all times. Even a glass of water they will not get for themselves, supposedly because they're studying and can't afford to waste any time. And they end up spoiled, both boys and girls. Even when they're not doing their homework, they still expect to be served. And of course, it's the mothers who are responsible. You go ahead and study, son, they say. I'll go and get your socks and your wash your feet. Here's your coffee. Here's your dessert. And the children never realize how tired the mother gets from offering so much because they never have to work for anything. Then they begin using disposable dishes, disposable clothes, eating pizzas and not even knowing how to wrap one up. Thus they become useless human beings who find life itself boring and tiresome. When their shoelace comes untied, all they know to say is, Mother, please tie my shoelace. And they go on stepping on it, doing nothing. How can these children ever achieve anything in life? They're incapable of getting married or becoming monks. This is why I tell mothers, do not let your children study all day. They will become dizzy. Have them take breaks of a quarter, half an hour. Do some work around the house to clear and rest their mind a little. These bad habits <clears throat> among young people today are carried over to monasticism. For instance, in one holy monastery, there may be seven secretaries on duty all of them educated, including the oldest. In the old days, there was only one secretary with barely two years of high school education, and he was able to handle the full load of work himself. And now with seven secretaries and admins and the senior one helping, they're all drowning in work and are unable to find time to carry out their spiritual duties. Directives from Dark Powers Today, many young people are being misguided and destroyed by all kinds of ideas and all kinds of theories. This is why so many of them are upset and confused. They want to go in one direction, but the current of our times takes them elsewhere. There are dark powers out there pushing their propaganda on young people who may not be very intelligent. In schools, for example, some teachers will say to their students, if you want to develop initiative, do not listen to your parents. Do not obey them. Words like these ruin young people. They no longer listen to their parents or teachers. And you can't blame them, really, since that's what they think is expected of them. 
On the one hand, there is the state, which often supports this kind of behavior, while on the other hand, we have people who care nothing about country and family, issuing directives and taking advantage of the young people to achieve their evil ends. As a result, our youth has been so harmed that some of them end up under the direct leadership of the devil himself. Satan worship is widespread. One can hear people in clubs singing all night, Satan, we adore you. We do not want Christ. You give us everything. What a horrific thing. But what is it that the devil will give you? And what will he take from you, miserable children? You see, young men and women, adolescent youths, who have a wild look in their eyes from the many coffees they drink and the many cigarettes that they smoke. Their eyes do not sparkle. The glow of God's grace is nowhere to be seen on their face. An architect was right when he said to a group of young people who he was escorting to the Holy Mountain, Our eyes resemble the eyes of spoiled fish. He had accompanied a group of ten young men between the ages of 18 and 25 to Holy Mountain. He himself had made a spiritual turn in his life and felt bad for young people who lived prodigal lives. So he convinced some of them to come to the Holy Mountain. I met them on my way down from the cell. I said to them, I'm on my way out, but let's sit here for a while. And we did. At the same time, some students were returning from the Ath Athonius Academy, and I invited them to join us. And we all sat together. The architect asked his company, have you noticed something here? And the young men looked puzzled. Look at each other's eyes and then look at the eyes of these students. Do you see that their eyes sparkle while ours resemble those of a spoiled fish? And indeed, when I looked carefully at them, I realized that their eyes did resemble the eyes of spoiled fish, dull, spoiled, while the Athonius' students' eyes would sparkle. The youths from the academy made prostrations, attended regular worship services. The eyes are the reflection of the soul. This is why Christ said, Your eye is the lamp of your body. Luke 11, 34. So many youths come to the holy mountain or go to other monasteries and become monks. And despite the fact that monastic life is, what should I say, no piece of cake, the joy they experience radiates from their face. But for so many who live in the world, life is sheer hell. They have everything they want, but their life is full of pain. Various trends have come to us today from all directions. Hinduism and other occult religions have come from the East. Communism from the North. Various theories from the West. From the South, from Africa, we get magic and other forms of cancer. A young man wounded by such beliefs came to me once. I understood that it was his mother's prayers that brought him to me. After we had conversed for a while, I told him, Look, son, you must find a spiritual father so that you may go to confession, receive the holy chrism, and get some help in the beginning. You must be anointed again with the holy chrism because you have renounced Christ. The poor child was crying. Father, please pray for me, he was pleading. I cannot get rid of all these ideas. They've brainwashed me. I know that my mother's prayers have brought me to you. Oh, how a mother's prayers can help us. These poor children are ruined. They get trapped. Then they panic. They become anxious and turn to drugs and go from one evil to another. May God help them. Yananda, does it help to tell these youths that these are satanic things? Of course it helps, but you must find the right way to say it. How can these youths get to know Christ? How can they possibly come to know Christ when before learning anything about orthodoxy, they go to the gurus of India and stay there for two or three years? Then after they get dizzy with all the magic tricks, they find out that there is mysticism in orthodoxy and end up here seeking to see the light and have experiences of a higher nature. And if you ask them, how long has it been since you took Holy Communion? They say, 
I do not remember if my mother had taken me to receive Holy Communion when I was little. You ask them, have you ever gone to confession? I don't care about confession, they reply. How can you get anywhere with these people when they know nothing about orthodoxy? How will they be helped, Yananda? Well, how can you help them if they see the church as, quote, the establishment? You realize that it will be very difficult to find common ground with them. But young people of good disposition will be helped and will, in the end, return to the church. Don't touch the children. Yet under what will become of so many children who grow up today without discipline? For them, there will be mitigating circumstances. It is the parents who never understood the nature of discipline that now allow their children such excessive freedom and turn them into little hooligans. You say one word to them and they'll respond with five, and with such impudence. These children may one day turn into criminals. Today, many children are totally unraveled by too much freedom and no discipline. Don't touch the children. These are the slogans in society. And of course, what do children think? Where else are we going to find a better re regime than that? In other words, they are deliberately turning them into little rebels who do not want to listen to parents, to teachers, or to anyone else. This serves their designs perfectly, for if children are not first taught to be rebellious, how can they end up later destroying everything? And you can see the poor youth looking like they're virtually demonized. If we monks cannot put freedom to good use in the spiritual life, what is one to expect of people who live in the world? If freedom is not put to good use, it is worth nothing. All it brings is disaster. This is why the country is heading in the wrong direction. Can today's people make good use of the freedom given to them? When freedom does not serve the cause of true progress, the result is catastrophe. Combined with secular progress, this sinful freedom has given rise to spiritual slavery. True spiritual freedom is spiritual obedience to the will of God. But you see, whereas it is obedience that will give us true freedom, the tempter, out of malice, presents it as enslavement. And so our youth today, who have become poisoned by the spirit of rebellion, reject obedience. It is understandable that these young people are tired of the various ideologies of the 20th century, which unfortunately distort God's beautiful creation and fill his creatures with anxiety, putting a gap between them and the true joy that is God. Have you any idea what we went through when we were discharged from the army? If we were at all like today's youth, we would have gone on a rampage and destroyed everything on our path. It was in 1950 when the guerrilla war was over and many classes of recruits were discharged simultaneously from the army. Some of us had been to war for four and a half years, others for four, others for three and a half. Well, after all these hardships, we arrive in Larissa and we head for the transit centers only to find them full. So we tried some hotels, but they would not accept us. Soldiers, they must have thought, if they lodge here, not a single blanket will be left clean. We, of course, had the money to pay the rate. It was March and very cold. Fortunately, an officer saved us. May God keep him well. He went and found out the train schedules and their maneuvers and arranged to have us spend the night in the trains. They will do maneuvers throughout the night, he told us. But don't be afraid. The trains will depart at this or that time in the morning. And indeed, the trains were maneuvering all night long. Finally, we got to Thessaloniki. Some of us were from around there and went to their homes. The rest of us went to transit centers, but they too were full. Next, we tried the hotels, but no luck. I pleaded with them at the hotel. Please give me a chair to sit on and I will pay double the rate of a room. Sorry, we can't do that, they replied. They were afraid that someone might see me and turn them in for not giving a soldier a room. I spent the whole night outside with other soldiers standing up and leaning against a wall. There were soldiers lying down on all the pavements as if we had a parade. If today's youth were in our place, 
They would have burned Larissa, Thessaly, and the entire province of Macedonia to the ground. Although they face nothing compared to what we had to go through, they still do takeovers, destroy property, and so on. And back then, all these poor soldiers were thinking so differently. They felt hurt and bitter, but it never crossed their mind to do anything bad. They had been through so many hardships in the snow. Many had been wounded and crippled in the war. They sacrificed so much. And now they had to sleep out on the street. That was the thank you they got. I can't help comparing today's youth with the young men I knew then. No more than 50 years have gone by. But look how the world has changed. Today's youth resembles a calf that is tied in a meadow and constantly kicks and pulls on the rope to remove the stake and run away. Then it breaks loose, runs off, gets all tangled up, and finally beasts come and devour it. When a child is young, it helps to apply the break. You see, for example, a mischievous young boy climbing a wall where he may fall and hurt himself badly. No, no, you shout, and you give him a slap or two. Next time he'll be careful because he will think of the danger, but because he will be afraid of being slapped. Today, no punishments are given out in schools or even in the army. This is why young people are such a menace to their teachers and the nation. In the army in the old days, the more austere the basic training was, the greater the bravery the soldiers would show in battle. A young person needs a spiritual guide, someone who will advise him and be eager to listen to his concerns in order to proceed with spiritual security, without dangers, without fears, and without dead ends. All of us, as we grow older, acquire experience from our own life and from the lives of others. But a young person lacks this experience. An older person should use his experience to help inexperienced youth avoid blunders. When young people refuse to take advice, they end up experimenting with their own lives. But if they take the advice given to them, they will have much to gain. Young men from a Christian organization visited the cell once and were boasting with self-confidence. We don't need anybody. We'll find our own way. Who knows why they said that? Perhaps they'd been pressured too much and were rebelling. When they were about to leave, they asked me to point them the right direction for Iveron Monastery. <clears throat> Which way should we go, they asked. Hey, wait a minute, I told them. Didn't you boys say that you needed no one, that you will find your own way? Didn't you just say that? Miss this road and you'll have only a minor inconvenience at some point. You'll run into someone and he'll show you the way. But who's going to show you the road to heaven? How will you get there on your own without a guide? One of them said, you know, the elder may have a point. Youth must pass the test of purity. A few female students came to see me today and told me, Yeranda, pray so that we'll pass our exams. I said, I will pray that you pass your purity exams. This is the most important thing. Everything else falls into place after that. It was the right thing to say, wasn't it? There's no greater sight than that of modesty and purity in the faces of young people today. No greater sight. Some traumatized young women come to see me. They live unruly lives with young men, and they don't realize that these men do not have good intentions, and of course they end up getting hurt. What must I do, Father, they ask. The tavern owner, I replied, may have the drunkard as a friend, but he will never accept him as his son-in-law. Stop having relations. If the man really loves you, he will appreciate it. If he leaves you, you will know that he doesn't love you, and this way you will not be wasting your time. The cunning devil takes advantage of young people who, on top of everything else, have to deal with the rebellion of their flesh, and he tries to destroy them during this difficult period of their life when the mind is not yet mature, the experience is missing, and their spiritual reserves, they're almost non-existent. This is why, during the critical period, young people must always seek the advice of their elders, so that they may not slip down the sweet secular slope, which will only fill their soul with anxiety and separate it eternally from God. 
I know that a physiologically healthy young person cannot easily attain a spiritual state where there is neither male nor female. Galatians 3.28 This is why the spiritual fathers recommend that young men and women, no matter how spiritual they may be, should not spend time together. At their age, problems will naturally arise and then temptation will step in and take advantage of their youth. It is better for a young man or a young woman to bear this heavy cross and risk being considered a fool by the opposite sex for his or, own, his or her spiritual prudence and innocence. This heavy cross hides all the power and wisdom of God, making a young man stronger than Samson and wiser than Solomon. Better than that he walk down the street praying rather than looking left and right, even if relatives may misunderstand him and think he snubbed them by not speaking with them. Otherwise, if he walks around looking with curiosity, he may get in trouble or get misunderstood by lay people who always harbor suspicious thoughts. It's a thousand times better to leave church right away after liturgy, like a lone animal, and keep his good spiritual sense and whatever he learned intact rather than stay around and stare at fancy furs or ties and become spiritually agitated as the enemy starts scratching at his heart. It is true, unfortunately, that there is so much filth in this world that no matter what path the soul desires, that desires purity may follow, it will get soiled. The difference is that God will not make the same demands on a Christian who wishes to remain pure today that he made in the past. Purity requires nerves of steel. A young man must try every means to resist temptation and he will surely have Christ's help. When divine eros is kindled in his heart, the burning is such that every other desire and unseemly picture will be burned out. When this divine fire is burning in, in us, we experience pleasures so divine that all other pleasures pale in comparison. When we taste heavenly manna, wild caribs will mean nothing to us. This is why we should hold fast to the steering wheel, make the sign of the cross, and not be afraid. At every little struggle, heavenly delight follows. If we are brave when temptation comes, God and the Panagia will help miraculously. The elder, Augustinos, had told me the following story. Footnote, please see St. Paisios of Manathos, Athenite Fathers and Athenite Matters, also previously narrated. To continue, when he was a young novice, he lived in a monastery in his native Russia. Most of the fathers there were old, and so they would use him for various chores, such as helping a monastery employee with fishing, or the monastery's main means of support. One day the daughter of that employee came and asked her father to return home for an emergency, and she stayed to help in his place. But the poor girl was seized by temptation, and without thinking, came on the novice with sinful intentions. Antonios, that was his name when he was in the world, was taken aback because everything happened so suddenly. He crossed himself and said, My Christ, I'd rather drown than sin, and plunged into the deep river. But the good Lord, seeing the hero heroism of this chaste young man who acted like St. Marti Martianios, footnote the biography of St. Martian Martin, we commemorate his name on February 13th, mentions that when he was an ascetic living on a rocky outcropping in the sea, a shipwrecked girl approached the rock on a raft and begged him to save her from the sea. The saint first pulled her out of the water to safety on his rock and then after praying jumped into the sea. By divine providence, dolphins came and took St. Martianios on their backs and carried him to safety on the shore. To continue... who acted like St. Martin in order to remain chaste, kept him afloat and completely dry. You see, he explained to me, I jumped head first into the river, and I still cannot figure out how I found myself standing up with my clothes dry. At that moment he had felt an internal peace and inexpressible sweetness that made every sinful thought and carnal desire 
caused by the indecent gestures of the young woman to go away. When she saw Antonio standing up on the water, she was overcome by repentance and started weeping, deeply moved by this great miracle. Christ does not require big things from us to help us in our struggle. He expects very little, a tiny bit. A young man was telling me that he went to Patmos to worship and fell into temptation's trap. A female tourist jumped on him and hugged him while he was walking. He pushed her away saying, My Christ, I have come for worship, not for love. And he went away. That same night in his hotel room during prayer, he saw Christ immersed in the uncreated light. Do you see the reward he received for that one push? Others strive for years in the ascetic life and may never be blessed with something like that. And he saw Jesus Christ only because he resisted temptation. And this experience naturally made him stronger spiritually. Later on, he saw St. Markella, St. Raphael, and St. George more than once. One day he came and told me, Father, say a prayer for me so that I may see St. George again and be consoled. I cannot find any consolation in this world. And then you see where other people, where other young people end up. A young man with his elderly uncle came to my cell once and told me, pray for a young girl who broke her spine in an accident. Her father fell asleep at the wheel, killing himself and injuring her. Let me show you a picture of her. It's not necessary, I said. He insisted and they showed me the picture of a girl who was lying down and two men were embracing her. Who is this young man? I asked. A friend, he answered. Will he marry her? No, they're just friends, he replied. Don't hold it against them, father, the uncle told me. That's how young people are today. I will pray, I thought to myself, but she does not just need her spine to be straightened out. Her mind also needs correction, and so does yours, you hopeless man. Where is the respect? His uncle should have told him off, and they were supposedly spiritual people. It is so sad to have spiritual guidance and still be in such a state of spiritual confusion. Even if he intended to marry her, there was no reason for her to be stretched out between the two men and for the man to be showing me the picture. It never crossed his mind that what he was doing was wrong. I'm not bothered by the picture, but it is still not right. What sort of family will these young people make? May God help them come to their senses. In the old days, young women would sacrifice everything to keep their chastity. I remember during the war against Italy, they had drafted some villagers and their animals, and they got trapped on a hill by heavy snowfall. The men gathered under the snow, covered spruce trees, and made some shelters using spruce branches to protect themselves. The women were forced to seek protection from their fellow villagers, people they knew. Two of them, one young, one elderly, from a faraway village, had to enter one of these shelters. Now, unfortunately, there are those faithless cowards from whom even a war will not make a difference. They have no feelings whatsoever for their fellow human beings who may die or get injured. If they get the chance, they will do their best to sin because they are afraid that they may get killed and try to use all the time they have to have fun. When in danger, people should repent. One of these men who had sin rather than repentance in his mind was harassing the young woman so much that she was forced to leave the group. She preferred to freeze to death from the cold rather than lose her chastity. Her virginity. When the elderly woman saw that her young companion had left the shelter, she followed her tracks and found her 30 minutes away under a small shed in a chapel dedicated to St. John the Forerunner. You see how St. John the Baptist cared about this honest woman and led her to his chapel, which she never knew existed? And guess what else the saint did? He appeared to a soldier in his sleep, told him to go to his chapel as soon as possible. Footnote, this soldier was, in fact, Elder Paisios himself. 
The incident took place during the guerrilla war when the Yerondo was doing his military service. To continue, so the soldier got up in the middle of the snow-lit night and headed to the chapel. He had a rough idea where it was. When he got there, he saw the two women, stuck in the snow, up to their knees, blue in the face and frozen from the cold. He immediately opened the chapel and they all entered and felt better. The soldier had nothing else to offer them besides a scarf for the old lady and a pair of gloves, which he told them to share, so that they could warm first one hand and then the other. They then told him about the temptation they had confronted. Why, the soldier asked the young woman, did you decide to leave in the middle of the night with all this snow and head to an unknown place? She replied, I did all that I could for my part, but I was convinced that Christ would take care of the rest. Feeling their pain and trying to console them, the soldier said spontaneously, Your troubles are over. Tomorrow you will be home. These words made them happy and they felt even warmer. Sure enough, the battalion of mountain transports opened the road and in the morning, military trucks came and the poor women were taken home. It is Greek women like them, vested in divine grace, rather than stripped of clothes and divine grace alike, who deserve our praise and admiration. Later, that beast, may God forgive me for this word, told the commander that a certain soldier had broken the chapel's door and put mules inside. The commander replied, I don't believe the man you acu accuse would do such a thing. In the end, he was sent to prison. Young people will sense true love. Yet it seems that people who want to destroy society have seized upon its foundation, its roots, our young people, and have destroyed them. There is no way that they will succeed. Evil self-destructs. In Russia, after the revolution, they destroyed everything. And look, look what's happening now. After three generations, God will not allow it. And he will not judge the sins of today's youth as strictly as he will judge the sins of our generation. Yernada, how come some young men and women who lead secular lives give very good answers to questions of faith? These young people had good intentions but were not able to apply the brakes on themselves at the right time and so they were swept along. That is why they give the right answers. What I mean to say is that someone, for example, wants to follow a particular path in life. He wants to go in that direction, but he finds it hard to follow. And when he sees another who succeeds, he has great respect for him. God will not abandon those who want the good because they lack malice. The time will come when they will find the strength to follow the right path. Yerunda, how should we approach young people who have gone astray? Love is the answer. Where there is true and noble love, young people will sense it. They will, will be informed right away and feel disarmed. Young men who come to myself come from all walks of life with all kinds of problems. I welcome them. I give them a treat. We start a conversation. Soon enough, we become friends. They open their heart to me and accept the love I give them. Among them are some who are so deprived of love. Poor souls, they're so thirsty for it. You can tell right away those who have never felt a mother's or father's love. If you care for them, if they sense your love, they forget all their problems, even their drug use. All their ills disappear. They stop getting in trouble and end up coming to the holy mountain as pious pilgrims. You see, they somehow come to sense God's love. And I see in them such nobility that it breaks my heart. They refuse financial aid even though they need it so much. And they get a job during the day to make ends meet and go to school at night. They deserve all the help they can get. Near the new train station in Thessaloniki, some of these young people, men and women, will pull their resources together and stay under the same roof. You could find as many as 15 living in one apartment. Many of them come from broken homes. Some of them will steal to make ends meet, but others have philotimo and will not do it. For years I have been telling many people to approach them, to help them. I had asked for a church to be built nearby so that they can gather there and have a shelter. Now they have built a small chapel dedicated to the apostle and deacon Philip, the protector 
of railway workers. What I have come to realize is that if we don't take advantage of the opportunities offered to us when we are young, the devil will exploit this situation. Don't we have the saying, strike while the iron is hot? When ironsmiths wanted to join two pieces of iron together, this was before modern welding, they would put the iron in the fire, pour hot water and borax on it, and then the moment they removed it, while still spewing sparks, they would join it to another piece. But this would not work if the iron got cold. It's the same thing with a young person. When opportunities present themselves and he shows no interest, he will concern himself with other people, judging them, criticizing their ways, and thus slowly losing the grace of God. But if he is full of divine fervor, he will prosper. This is why parents should help their children as much as they can when they're still young. Children are like empty cassette tapes. If we fill them with Christ, they will stay close to him forever. If we don't, it will be easier for them to go astray when they become older. But if we help them when they are young, even if they later stray a bit, they will eventually come to their senses. Wood soaked in oil does not rot. Youth soaked in the oil of piety and the fear of God will have nothing to fear later. Part 3 continued. Chapter 4. Impudence and Lack of Respect. Boldness Drives Reverence Away. Yet under what causes us to speak boldly and without reserve? Where is boldness from? And boldness in, in the Greek in parentheses, parousia. St. Paisio's answer, from Paris, a play on words from the original word for boldness, referring to European spirit. To continue, this kind of speech betrays impudence. It drives away the fear of God in us, much like smoke will drive bees away from the beehive. Yet under how can I avoid such boldness? You must feel that you are beneath everybody else. This takes a lot of humility. Being the youngest here, you must have respect and reverence for all the sisters. State your thoughts with humility and avoid appearing as if you know everything. God will then be blessing you with his grace and you will be making good progress. Outspoken boldness is the novice's worst enemy because it takes away reverence. Usually such boldness results in rebellion and then one starts becoming insensitive and indifferent to small sins until gradually they become a habit and second nature. But deep inside the soul cannot find rest and is filled with anxiety. It is then difficult to understand one's condition because the heart is smeared with grime and cannot feel the wrong turns it is making. Yet under what is the relationship between simplicity and boldness? There is a very clear difference between the two. Simplicity entails reverence and has a childlike quality, but the mark of boldness is audacity. Sometimes a person who is candid, candid and frank will also be impudent. When we are not careful, straightforwardness and simplicity may end up harboring impudence. We say, for instance, I am a straight arrow, or I am a plain person, and without realizing it, we put a lot of impudence in our words. It's one thing to be plain, it's another to be impudent. Yet under what is to be spiritually reserved? It is to have the fear of God and the good sense of the word. This fear and sense of awe brings gladness and sweetness to the heart. It begins to drip with honey of the spiritual kind. You see a little child who is reserved and out of respect for his father will not even look at him in the eyes. When he goes close to him to ask for something, he blushes. That's the kind of child one wants to place on the iconostasis. And then you have the child that will think, he is my father after all. And with that in mind, he will put on airs and act out. And when he wants something, he demands it with tantrums and threats. In a good family, the children will usually move about with a sense of freedom. They will have respect for the parents without being overly reserved and afraid of speaking out. Discipline is not rigid as in the military. The children enjoy their parents and the parents enjoy their children. Love does not know shame. 
a seed, St. Isaac the Syrian's ascetical homily 51. Abba Isaac says, Love has courage in the good sense of the word. It has reverence and devotion, and so it wins over fear. One person with reserve will hesitate and be afraid because he does not have true reserve. One who does, who has the true spiritual reserve, is never afraid. When the reserve we feel is spiritual, we are filled with joy. When a small child loves his mother and father with this kind of boldness, it is not afraid of being struck by them. He takes his father's hat, even when it's an officer's hat, throws it in the air and has such a good time. He is plain and simple, but in the good sense, not that of audacity. It is important that we separate the one from the other. Where there is no respect, no reserve, we end up with impudence, boldness, and audacity. Take, for example, a young woman who lies in bed and tells her mother, Mother, bring me a glass of water. Make it very cold. Oh, this is not cold. Didn't I say cold? When they start out like this, they will no doubt come to question St. Paul's admonition, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Footnote Ephesians 5.33 The original Greek text has, quote, let the wife see that she fears her husband. To continue, why should a woman fear her husband? They will object. What they don't understand is that this kind of fear is filled with respect. Well, respect is filled with love. It's not possible that I respect someone and not love him. A woman should respect her husband. The man should love his wife. What they do nowadays is level everything. Families end up falling apart because they take the gospel and read it upside down. It's the wife that must obey, says the husband. What he does not understand is that if you don't have love, you cannot make even a kitten obey you. If you have no love, the other person will not respond. They will not retrieve, receive the information, and you will not be able to ask them for anything, even for a glass of water. When we have respect for the other person, we have respect for ourselves too, but not of the calculating, self-serving kind. The respect we show to others is full of philotimo, but where our respect is mainly for our own self, philotimo and self-sacrifice is absent. Respect for elders. Sometimes, Yeranda, I speak badly to my elders. I realize it and go to confession. Since you realize it and confess it, you will gradually feel disgust for yourself, the good kind of disgust and you will be humbled, and then the grace of God will come, and your bad habit will go away. Yeah, sometimes I joke around and tease the sisters lovingly, but I am afraid that I might be too bold. You are too young to be teasing others. Usually in a family, the older members tease and joke with the younger ones, and not the opposite. This way, both young and old enjoy the exchange. It's not right for a child to tease a grandmother or a grandfather. Can you imagine a little child going up to his dad all of a sudden and tickling him under the chin? It's different when the adult pokes fun at the child, and the child enjoys it and responds with ease and delight. This way the adult turns into a child, and both end up having a good time. Yet when I offer my opinion to an older person about something he said, which I think is not correct, and he rejects it, should I then come to agree with him? No, you should not agree with something that is wrong. You must say what is right, but in a good and proper manner. For example, you may say, maybe we should do it this way. What do you think? It's just a thought. Or you can say, I have this thought. This is how you become a magnet and attract the grace of God. There are some people who will speak very boldly, not intentionally, but out of habit. In any case, no matter what, one must have respect for one's elders. Respect is something that older people want. Even if they have flaws, they still have their good sides. They have experience in life. When asked for your opinion, you should express it humbly and respectfully, without presuming that things are as you say, because the other person may know something you do not know, or you did not think about. 
when someone is young and while listening to a conversation on a particular subject thinks that his take on it is more correct. What he should say if the person he is talking with is of the same age is something like, this idea crossed my mind. If the conversation is with an older person, then the one who is younger should think, I've just had this blasphemous thought. And even if the thought is correct, it would be impudence for him to state it if he is not the person in charge. Question. When you say older, do you mean an older person in years or in spiritual maturity? I mean primarily an older person in age. Besides, even someone who has reached an advanced spiritual state should respect his elders. It is right, Yana, to respect more someone who is younger in age but more advanced spiritually than someone who is older but less advanced spiritually? No, this is not the right approach. No matter what an older person is, you must respect him for his age. You will respect an older person for his age and a younger person for his devotion. Where there is respect, the younger person will respect the older, and the older person will respect the younger. Hidden in respect is love. The Apostle Paul says, Pay all of them their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Romans 13, verse 7. Is it wrong for a young person to reprimand an older person? This is the habit of the new generation, but Holy Scripture says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Matthew 18, verse 15. It does not say, go and tell your father his fault. But these days, young people seem to have an opinion to carry the spirit of resistance without realizing it about everything. They consider this behavior natural. They speak with audacity and tell you things like, I was straight as an arrow. They have been affected by this world's vagrant spirit and have respect for nothing. The young have no respect for their elders and don't even realize how bad this is. But what can you expect when you hear a young person say that respect for older people is old-fashioned, and when in his mind this is a proof of his personality? We need to be very careful. What young people hear from the secular spirit today is, do not listen to your parents, your teachers. This is why even young children turn out much worse now than they did in the past. And those who are damaged the most are the ones whose parents do not realize the harm they are doing by the admiration and praise they show them when they speak out with impudence. Once two young cousins around eight, nine years old had come to my cell with their fathers. I put one of them to my right, the other one to my left. On that day it happened that an artist friend of mine, a very nice young man, was also there. He could sketch your portrait in no time. Dionysi, I said, why don't you sketch these children as they sit here with me? Let me see if I can manage, he said, because they can't stand still. He took out a sheet of paper and started drawing. One of the boys jumps up and says in front of all these people, let's see what you can come up with, you dummy. And there were all these people all around. The young artist was not disturbed at all. That's today's children for you, father. He said, I, on the other hand, was really furious. What the boy said made my blood boil. The father of the boy acted like nothing had happened. Can you imagine speaking to a 30-year-old man like that while he is sketching your portrait? This is audacity, irreverence, and so much more. Could this boy ever become a monk? When mothers do not take care of their children, this is how they turn out. They are ruined. It's the mother that makes the difference. She is the foundation. If things have changed in Russia, it's because the mothers secretly kept both their faith and reverence and in so doing helped their children. Fortunately, there is still some yeast of Christian families left. Otherwise, our situation would be hopeless. Yet on the left, children who are raised in this manner want to change their ways later in life or become monks, will they be able to? If they realize that what they were doing is wrong, Christ will help them. 
In other words, the moment the good kind of concern enters the soul, the problem is resolved. But if they never question their way, then they will end up saying of their abbot or abbess, what is this, a dictatorship? Have you ever heard of such absolute discipline in our times? How can someone who thinks this way ever change? And yet there are some young monks who will end up, who will come up to me and tell me this kind of nonsense. This is how respect is gradually disappearing. Young boys that come to my cell, most of them will sit with their legs crossed while their elders are standing. Others, while they see that there are some logs a few steps away, are too lazy to go and fetch them. I must go and bring them. And while they see me carrying them, they do not offer to give me a hand. They want water to drink, but they will not go to get it by themselves. I must go and bring it to them, and they even send me back for a second cup. I find this so striking. Here there are thirty young men, healthy and fit, that come to my cell. They see me limping and carrying a box of sweets, a large vessel of water, and cups to serve them, and they will not move a finger. They sit there waiting, and only a brigadier general, seasoned in battles, will get up and offer to help. They behave as if my cell is a restaurant or a hotel, and all they need to do is wave at the waiter to serve them. You know what I did on a few occasions? I went and got the water, brought it where they were, poured it right in front of them and said, I went and got you the water, fellows, but I don't think it'll help you any. Then, in city buses, you will see children sitting and old people standing, or young men and women sitting with their legs crossed, while others much older in age get up and offer their seat to an elderly person. But the young will not give up their seat. I paid for it, they object. They couldn't care less. In the old days, people had the right spirit. Women would sit outside on the street, and when a priest or an elderly person would pass by, they would stand up, and they taught their children to do the same. There are times when I get so upset. You see older, serious people with high positions in society having a conversation, and then these children come and interrupt with such audacity, only to say something foolish, and they consider it an achievement. I gesture that to them, to stop interrupting, but nothing. You must put them to shame before they will stop, otherwise they will go on talking. No patristic text says that young people should talk that way. In fact, we read in the Yerondikon, quote, an elder once said, it does not say anywhere, a young man once said, in the old days, children would not speak in the presence of adults, and they were happy at that, nor did they sit where the adults sat. They were reserved and respectful and even blushed when they talked to adults, and if a child spoke badly to his parents, he would not dare appear in public out of shame. On the holy mountain, if a monk did not have a white beard, he was not allowed in the choir. Nowadays, everybody is allowed, novices and pre-novices, are gathered around the lectern to chant. At least they should learn to behave with respect and reverence. It is not actually unusual to hear even a student at the Athonius Academy in Keres tell the director, who is also a bishop, Holy Director, let's speak man to man. This is where things have come to. And what's worse is that they will come and tell you why. What did I say that was so bad? He will not say, Evlogison, forgive me, Father, may I have your blessing to express a thought as dumb as it may be. Instead, they come at you and speak their mind as if there was nothing wrong. It's your opinion versus mine. Do you see what I mean? Unfortunately, this same spirit has entered monasticism and spiritual life. You hear novice monks saying, I have told the elder so many times, but he does not understand me. You know how many times I have told him? It's like they're saying that Yerunder will not correct himself. Why, they go on, can't I even express my opinion? I, f I feel like exploding when I hear such things. And at the end they will tell you, Oh, I didn't realize that I upset you. I am sorry. He 
wants me to forgive him, not for his selfish audacity and impudence, but for making my blood boil. 